my pleasure as a president for the ICP to host 2021 Henry N. Newfield Lecture. This year's lecture, the title will be Atrial Fibrillation, What Does the Future Hold? And we give special thanks to Professor Barbara Cassidy, the Henry N. Newfield Lecturer of 2021. My name is Jack, the current president for the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology, as well as the president for the International Society of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy. I'd like to briefly speak to Professor Henry N. Newfield. Professor Newfield was born in the 1923. He was actually a Holocaust survivor and luckily he escaped to Vienna where he graduated with a doctor of medicine by 1948. He subsequently spent many years of his career at the Cham Shiba Medical Center in Tel Aviv, Israel, where he became the professor and chair of the department. He then worked as well under Dr. E.H. Wood at the Mayo Clinic as a research fellow. To just state a few contributions he had to professional cardiology, he worked in numerous committees in the World Heart Organization, including the World Heart Organization Task Force Against Heart Disease. He was the president for the Israel Heart Association, the president for the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology, the president for the IACP, as well as its founder, and also the president for the Federation of Cardiology, now the World Heart Federation. I think we should all take this pause to remember the great strides in cardiovascular pharmacotherapy over the later half of the 20th century. It has been exciting times for cardiology, building on to greats like Professor Newfield. And to name just a few, the first beta blocker was discovered by James Black in 1965. The first calcium antagonist was investigated by Albrecht Frankenstein and Harold Reiter in the 60s. And the first statin discovered by Professor Kiro Endo in 1976. And the first ACE inhibitor was discovered by David Cushman and Mikhail Odenti in 1977. So truly as a young cardiologist myself, we stand on the shoulders of giants and greats that has contributed to the research and the workings of cardiology over the last 50 years to make it the very exciting field we are today. And the Professor Henry N. Newfield Memorial Lecture seeks to give honor to the professor, to the grades before, and to the ongoing strives and contribution of researchers worldwide in cardiology. The mission of the ICP, as stated by Professor Newfield, is a society dedicated to medical research in the field of cardiovascular pharmacotherapy and related areas of clinical cardiology. This was primarily going to be achieved by promoting the international exchange of information among the physicians engaged in these branches of study. For this purpose, the society should be authorized to conduct, organize, scientific meeting among scientists, doctors, in the form of meetings, congresses in all parts of the world. And today, in the 21st century, we do so over the internet. And this is embalmed into the Article 3 of the ICP Constitution, signed into the Constitution by Professor Newfield in 1983, in Zurich, Switzerland. In 1983 till today, the main topics of the ICP symposium continues to be hypertension, heart failure, ischemia, arrhythmias. And these topics are still exciting to this day with evolving cardiovascular pharmacotherapy. I also like to give special thanks to some of the greats and the founders, the initial pioneers of the ICP, starting with the 1985 ICP board with Professor Stanley Taylor, Professor Wilhelm, Professor Kuchi Kawai, Professor Elliot Rappaport, 
And Professor Wilhelm was the one who organized the first ICP meeting in Lake Geneva in 1985, when it could have been done in Tel Aviv. The second ICP meeting was done by Professor Elliot Rappaport, 1987, San Francisco. The third ICP hosted by Professor Kawai in Kyoto, Japan, 1989. The fourth ICP meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, again, by Professor Stanley H. Taylor from the United Kingdom. And the fifth ICP meeting conducted in Mayo Clinic, Minnesota, hosted by Professor Jay Cohn. There are multiple successful ICP biannual meetings subsequently. And today, we're very privileged to host the next installment of ICP in Singapore. Professor Linda Bediman, Henry N. Newfield Memorial Lecturer of 2018, she spoke to precision medicine, molecular phenotyping in cardiovascular chemical therapy. Professor Salim Yusuf was a Henry N. Newfield Memorial Lecturer of 2019. He spoke to the topic of the polypill. And we are very, very privileged and happy for Professor Barbara Cassidy, Oxford, United Kingdom, to deliver her Harry N. Newfield Memorial Lecture for 2021 this year. The title of the talk will be Atrial Fibrillation, What Does the Future Hold? Thank you, Professor Cassidy. I will now ask Professor Doreen Tan, Scientific Chair for ICP 2021, to deliver the citation for Professor Barbara Cassidy. Doreen, please. Professor Barbara Cassidy is a British Heart Foundation Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Oxford and Honorary Consultant Cardiologist at the Oxford University Hospitals NHS Trust, where she leads the cardiovascular theme of the National Institute for Health Research Biomedical Research Centre and a steering committee member of the BHF Centre for Research Excellence. Professor Cassidy graduated in medicine at the University of Pavia, Italy. Initially planning to stay only six months, she moved to Oxford in 1989 to undertake her clinical and research training that soon turned into a permanent residence. She was subsequently awarded the Joan and Richard Dahl Fellowship at Green College in 1991 a Doctor of Philosophy in Cardiovascular Medicine in 1995, and a BHF Senior Research Fellowship in 2001. Fellow of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences, she holds the highest honour of the British Cardiovascular Society, the Mackenzie Medal, and of the European Society of Cardiology, Gold Medal. Professor Barbara's advocacy work that is closest to my heart would be the one surrounding equal rights for deserving women. One can be a mother and still excel in their work is a statement that deeply resonates with me. She is the first female president of the ESC, having served an illustrious term of establishing new programs, including but not limited to the ESC Patient Forum. She founded the ESC Digital Committee and the ESC Digital Summit. She established the ESC Research Committee and thereby increasing the ESC investment in grant and fellowship by six-fold. She co-designed the two most successful ESC annual congresses to date, one in person in 2019 with more than 35,000 delegates, and one in the digital format in 2020 of 125,000 subscribers, both rated excellent by more than 85% of participants. Professor Cassidy is a member of several scientific advisories and editorial boards and has delivered numerous international prize lectures, including the William Harvey Lecture on Basic Science and Silver Medal of the ESC 2013, the Thomas Lewis Lecture and Silver Medal of the British Cardiovascular Society 2014, the Camillette Corabouf Whiteman Lecture of the European Heart Rhythm Association 2015, the Brexit Lecture of the European Heart Failure Association, the William Gash Lecture, University of Massachusetts in 2017, the Michael Soule Lecture, 
University of Toronto, 2019, and the Roman De Sanctis Lecture, Harvard Medical School in USA in 2021. She provides a clinical service at the John Radcliffe Hospital and leads a bench to bedside translational research program, which spans from bench-based in investigation in human tissue and cells to clinical trials. Her first taste of a mechanism when she injected nitroprusside in an attempt to measure its effects on left ventricular function in the absence of a barrel reflex response was what seeded her focus on the idea of nitric oxide and much of her work in atrial fibrillation commenced from there. Her accolades as a teacher and mentor shines forth in the achievements of her trainees in Doctor of Philosophy and the MSc. It is evident that whoever has had the privilege of being coached or taught by her will be truly inspired by her passion and curiosity. So let us sit back and enjoy listening to her pulse on atrial fibrillation, what does the future hold? Professor Babo Cassidy, please. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague, I'm delighted to have been given this opportunity uh, to present uh, our data as such an important uh, lecture. Um, Henry Neufeld uh, was the founder of your uh, society and uh, a distinguished clinic clinician scientist. Uh, and as such, uh, I'm really humbled to have been uh, honored this way. So today we're talking about atrial fibrillation. What does the future hold? And, uh, you know, what it is really the problem with atrial fibrillation and why I am interested in it is really summarized here. Uh, atrial fibrillation is a very common arrhythmia and this prevalence is predicted to increase because of the increased prevalence of uh, its risk factor and the aging of the population. Uh, it's also not a benign arrhythmia and is associated with an increased risk in stroke, uh, but possibly, you know, most commonly uh, cardioembolic ischemic stroke, myocardial infarction, and that is more difficult to understand, heart failure and premature death. And, uh, you know, years of uh, research uh, and uh, years of uh, many, many trials, uh, and we're still really looking at anticoagulation and so prevention of thromboembolic event as the only treatment that has been consistently shown to have a favorable impact on the prognosis of patients with atrial fibrillation. So essentially, what have we done wrong and what is the approach that we have taken uh, not uh, uh, really being the right one, or maybe we haven't pursued it uh, uh, far enough. So if we start from uh, the tradition, if you like, uh, the, uh, there is this uh, say that comes from Maastricht in the Netherlands, that atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation. And that is because if you take a healthy animal and you induce atrial fibrillation uh, with pacing, uh, after a while, the atrial fibrillation will be maintained uh, even when you switch the pacemaker off. So that is because it is, uh, as has been shown many times, that atrial fibrillation causes um, alteration in the electrical property of the atrial myocardium as well as in the structural and metabolic property that end up uh, providing a substrate for the maintenance of the arrhythmia. And indeed this has been shown many times. Uh, electrically we have a uh, shortening of the action potential duration as shown here, uh, thereby making re-entry uh, easier. Uh, we have altered myocardial energetics, the importance of which is still under investigation, and we have fibrosis, and so a prolonged conduction uh, velocity, conduction time in the atria, again uh, favoring re-entry. So being a, a nitric oxide lab, essential and reactive oxygen species lab, then we have noticed that all of these parameters can be influenced by nitric oxide or the lack of, of availability of nitric oxide in the atrial myocardium. And in fact, for quite a long time, it has been known that uh, nitric oxide 
production as measured here with a colorimetric assay is reduced just only after seven days of atrial fibrillation in a pig model, uh, most uh, uh, um, obviously in the left atrium, but also in the left in the right atrium. And uh, the culprit is, uh, according to this paper, a reduction in the um, protein content of the endothelial isoform uh, of uh, uh, nitric oxide synthase, or ENOS, particularly at the level of the atrial <coughs> endocardium, thereby favoring, from what we know about the actions of nitric oxide, platelet adhesion and therefore thrombus formation. So far, so good. But shortly after, we have another paper from another laboratory indicating that uh, the protein content of ENOS is, on the contrary, increased after just eight days of atrial tachypacing in the dog here. So what is going on? And uh, so this was the initial question that intrigued us. And does it matter, which is the, the key question. So the way we normally approach a, a problem like this is to start from uh, uh, looking at human atrial tissue from samples of the right and left atrial appendage from patients undergoing cardiac surgery, from, from, which, uh, sorry, from which we are isolated myocyte, uh, where we do calcium study or uh, cellular electrophysiology studies, uh, transcriptomics, uh, looking at microRNA, et cetera, but also fibroblast and uh, uh, inflammatory cells. Uh, if there is um, a pathway, uh, a, a signaling pathway that looks promising, then we try to either overexpress it or knock it out in a mouse to actually answer the question, is this sufficient uh, to reproduce the phenotype? And we can phenotype the mice uh, very uh, accurately now, as well as induce uh, atrial fibrillation in the mice. Then again, we can take it to a larger model in collaboration with our Dutch colleagues, uh, the goat in particular, and then we take it back into humans, either using advanced imaging uh, or clinical trials so, or looking at prospective cohorts such as UK Biobank. And today I will take you around this uh, uh, virtuous circle of experiments. So what did we do was to look at uh, 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 is the, to answer the question, is nitric oxide the production in the fibrillating atrium myocardium reduced? How much and for how long? And so we looked at goats where we know exactly when atrial fibrillation starts. Uh, and we look at uh, the atrial tissue left and right after two weeks of atrial fibrillation and after six months where remodeling structural as well as electrical and metabolic is well underway. <clears throat> and as you can see here, both in the right and in the left atrium, we have a reduction in uh, um, nitric oxide production here measured uh, by HPLC, uh, looking at the L-citrulline to uh, uh, enlarging into L-citrulline conversion, and you can see that uh, is reduced after two weeks and it stays reduced after six months. What about in humans? Uh, and here again, we look at patients in sinus rhythm at the time of surgery and patients uh, who have uh, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. And again, we see a reduction in nitric oxide production in the presence of atrial fibrillation. So far, so good, but again, uh, what it is responsible for this. And when we looked at uh, ENOS here, endothelial nitric oxide synthase in the goat, we really didn't see much difference and very subtle differences in, in humans, in, on, but nothing really to write home about. Whereas if we look at the uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, we can see that uh, both after two weeks and six months of atrial fibrillation, it is almost gone, disappeared. So in uh, the atrium, we know that uh, NOS is present in myocytes, but also present in parasympathetic ganglia. So it was important to find out where this, uh, uh, where we could attribute this, uh, uh, which cell type we could attribute uh, this reduction to. 
And in fact, if we take isolated atrial myocytes, uh, as shown here, we can see that, uh, again, there is a massive reduction in NNOS and is in the myocardium, thereby indicating that is the myocardial NNOS that accounts for the lower atrial NO synthesis in atrial fibrillation. But then again, why should this be? And what it is that uh, would make the NNOS disappear like that? Then we have some clues here from uh, uh, the world, well, what we know, uh, what the um, NNOS does and how it can be tethered to the membrane. So in terms of what it does, we have, we and others, I mean, I'm showing our work here, but uh, many others have published uh, uh, similar results that uh, the, this isoform is actually very important for the regulation of many processes in the myocardium from AC coupling to the calcium current, remodeling, uh, myocardial energetic and glucose uptake that we have just uh, published, uh, as well as flow independent coronary resistance. And here are all the fellows that won uh, investigators award presenting uh, this work. And uh, as I said, we know uh, from the um, muscular dystrophy world how it is that NNOS is tethered to the membrane. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, it is really part of the dystrophin syntrophin complex. And if we have no dystrophin, like in the Duchenne muscular uh, dystrophy, then we do not, uh, the NNOS. Uh, essentially uh, this decrease substantially and almost disappears uh, for reasons that are not entirely understood. So could it be that atrial fibrillation is a dystrophinopathy of the atrium? And in fact, when we looked, uh, we saw a reduction in dystrophin in the, the um, fibrillating atria, humans we're looking at here. And uh, you could see that uh, in the presence of sinus rhythm, dystrophy and dystrophin and NNOS largely uh, uh, co-localized, uh, whereas in the presence of atrial fibrillation, we have a reduction in dystrophin, but a somewhat disproportionate reduction in NNOS. Does it matter? Well, it does matter for the electrical property of the atrial myocardium. Uh, for instance, if in sinus rhythm we inhibit the activity of NOS with s methylthiocitrulline, as shown here, then we have a reduction in action potential duration uh, at 90% of repolarization, which is very similar to what we see uh, in the remodeled atrium uh, of fibrillating patients, uh, as shown here. And you could see that if we use SMTC in atrial fibrillation, we really see no further reduction. So this suggests a contribution of NNOS to the uh, remodeling. And as I said, does it matter for atrial fibrillation? The NNOS knockout mouse seems to, to suggest that it does, because even in the absence of structural remodeling, these mice uh, have uh, uh, a, they are more inducible for uh, atrial fibrillation. So, but then what it is that is decreasing dystrophin. And here really to make a, a, a very long story uh, short, uh, we have to see what uh, really regulates the life uh, of a protein. It has to be transcribed, it has to be translated, and then uh, uh, post-translation or modification of the protein can uh, also affect uh, the um, protein survival. So um, if, if I can say that, uh, we know that uh, in terms of translation, microRNA here, these small strands of RNA, have been shown to bind to um, the messenger RNA and to reduce the uh, translation into protein by uh, two mechanisms, either repressing it or accelerating the degradation of mRNA. And when we looked at uh, um, microRNA under these circumstances, then uh, we saw that in human atrial fibrillation, uh, we have an upregulation of microRNA 31, which is atrial specific. Uh, so it's a good target in that respect. 
uh, that has it has been shown in um, um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy binds to dystrophin and uh, uh, represses its translation. But it also, you know, this one causes uh, a NOS, uh, uh, this um, mislocalization in the cytoplasm and ubiquitination and proteosomal destruction. But uh, we also uh, have, uh, we also know the microRNA31 binds directly to the three prime UTR region of NOS mRNA, so directly targeting. Uh, and this messenger RNA by accelerating its decay. And as a result, we have a profound reduction in the availability of nitric oxide, which by um, affecting the potassium, repolarizing potassium currents, is uh, uh, reproducing the electrical phenotype of age of fibrillation, so contributing uh, uh, to, to this phenomenon. Uh, and therefore to the phenomenon by which atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation. And um, okay, we published this in 2016. How comes we haven't got uh, a, uh, a drug uh, or uh, a micro RNA, an antagomere that uh, is uh, um, sorting this situation out, for instance? Well, in fact, it is quite difficult. And there are uh, several uh, substantial uh, challenges here. For instance, uh, we know that naked microRNAs are very quickly degraded by nucleases in the, in the blood once they are in the circulation. And we also know that they can activate the immune system and therefore be pro-inflammatory. And we really don't want to see either of this. Uh, and this is potentially partially mitigated by chemical modification that, may, that can improve the stability and the target binding affinity of microRNA. Uh, we also know that uh, unless we want to target the microRNA to deliver, to do it in any other organ is very difficult. Um, this can be improved by loading them on viral vectors, uh, um, conjugating them with antibodies, etc. But again, this uh, has its challenges. Um, similarly, once they enter the cell, they tend to go into the endosome and they find it difficult to escape from there to do what they are supposed to be doing. Again, there are mitigation strategies for this, but not. None of this is perfect, but perhaps the most difficult uh, uh, and the biggest challenge here is uh, uh, the fact that microRNA exerts a, a moderate effect on multiple targets. And therefore, there is a very high risk of off-target effects uh, that can't really be circumvented because they are really uh, in the the way the microRNAs are, essentially, that's how they work. And for instance, microRNA31 has been implicated in several forms of cancers and depending on the tissue and type of cancer, they can both inhibit <clears throat> or stimulate the growth of several cancers. So that is a, a very large uh, uh, and significant challenge. So, but so far we've looked at uh, um, um, electrical, but what about uh, structural uh, remodeling and fibrosis, which is even more important because so far we haven't really been able to uh, reverse it. So uh, here again, Svetlana Riley that you saw in the previous uh, um, uh, paper as being the, the first author, uh, has recently produced this beautiful piece of work that was uh, uh, recently published in Nature. And what she has discovered is that atrial myocytes produce large quantity of calcitonin, a hormone that normally one <coughs> would uh, associate with the thyroid. And uh, that calcitonin then has a paracrine effect on atrial fibroblasts, which have calcitonin receptors on the surface in the presence of sinus rhythm. 
uh, this binding causes an increase in intracellular cyclic AMP, which then in turn uh, um, inhibits uh, the release of the uh, bone morphometric protein one, but also stimulates uh, proliferation and migration <clears throat> of fibroblast. Altogether, uh, BMP1 inhibits uh, uh, the maturation of procollagen to collagen, uh, which together with other uh, effects uh, is keeping fibrosis under control. But in the presence of uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, the situation is quite different because calcitonin uh, secretion from the uh, <clears throat> atrial myocyte is substantially reduced. And the uh, calcitonin receptors are uh, substantially reduced on the, on, the, on the membrane as well because they are internalized. And this, uh, as you can imagine, uh, causes the opposite of what I just said, an increase in BMP1 release and uh, an increase uh, in the uh, um, transformation of procollagen into collagen and a release uh, of fibroblast uh, migration and proliferation, therefore increasing fibrotic tissue and make it more likely for atrial fibrillation to uh, <clears throat> become persistent. Again, you know, there has, this is a, a very important contribution and a very important original contribution uh, but the, uh, it is not the first time, <laughs> let's say, that uh, <clears throat> one has tried to find a way to reverse uh, diffuse fibrosis uh, and to therefore improve not only uh, the substrate for atrial fibrillation, uh, I would say the, the substrate for sinus rhythm, but also in, in, in heart failure and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, you know there are several candidates here that you have seen before, and the chief orchestrator is TGF beta that has been targeted already, and there are problems here as well. So, for instance, uh, in experimental uh, studies, uh, inhibition of TGF beta that can be obtained, uh, it's actually not beneficial because uh, in the presence of pressure overload, for instance, it causes uh, dilatation and severe heart failure, suggesting that some uh, fibrous tissue, uh, the, the diffuse fibrosis also has uh, a uh, beneficial effect in, in uh, increasing, uh, if you like, the tone of the uh, left uh, ventricle. Uh, others uh, uh, seen the, you know, well-known players here, the renin angiotensin system uh, and some uh, um, diuretic, uh, loop diuretic such as teracemide has been uh, shown to um, have an effect on extracellular collagen processing. And, uh, you know, the, the, if you read this review, you know, they would say that these have been shown to have uh, antifibrotic effects. And there are several others here, as you can see, uh, targeting the usual suspects uh, here, and that are uh, also being tested, not so much on the myocardium, some of them are, uh, but uh, not as a sort of uh, um, main outcome. Uh, more like a secondary um, outcome. And uh, with, uh, I would say, variable success. So when also uh, you read and uh, you, you, you read that, for instance, inhibiting uh, toracemide, uh, uh, for instance, is decreasing fibrosis, you have to look quite carefully at the study. So here is, for instance, the paper that shows that, and uh, there are two groups here, of one group of, of patients with heart failure that are given uh, a traditional uh, loop diuretic, furosemide, and one that are given uh, toracemide. And you can see here from biopsy, that is definitely, there is a, a massive reduction in fibrosis. However, you know, this study has not been analyzed uh, as uh, 
you know, the four groups uh, uh, with analysis of covariance as it should have, uh, but only this against this and this against that, for instance. So it, there were supposed to be 20 patients per group, but there were some dropouts. So we're looking at a very small size of 17 versus 19. Uh, is an open label study and not, uh, uh, so it's not a blinded. Uh, is a single center, is a short term, and it was not analyzed according to intention to treat. The same uh, or similar, if not quite the same, is for lysinopril mediated regression of myocardial fibrosis in hypertensive heart disease. Here are 11 versus 13 patients out of 35 that were recruited, so a lot of dropouts, single center, short term, uh, again, not analyzed according to intention to treat. And you can see that the effects are tiny, you know, point, uh, uh, decimal points uh, reduction in uh, fibrosis. So we can't really say uh, confidently that this is uh, happening. It's more like hypothesis generating. And, you know, it hasn't really um, been followed up as well as it could have been. And we know what happened here. Um, you know, personally have been through this when I was looking at the effect of perioperative statin therapy on postoperative age of fibrillation in patients undergoing cardiac surgery. And if you could take a group of studies such as those that I have uh, shown you, uh, it seems to indicate that a few days of statin treatment perioperatively would reduce atrial fibrillation postoperatively by about 50%, as you can see here, right? Uh, but all of these studies have those problems. So they are open label, it was not the main outcome. So there is some kind of serendipitous reporting of uh, uh, data when they seem to look positive, uh, which also means that uh, when it was measured as a secondary, uh, as a by the way, uh, and it was uh, um, not uh, favorable, it might not have been reported, and so on and so forth. So one has to be extremely careful, because when we then did the study double-blind, randomized, much larger than all of this put together, uh, the results of perioperative prosuvastatin in cardiac surgery was nil. As you can see here, there is absolutely no benefit of it in postoperative age of fibrillation. Not only that, but patients allocated to rosuvastatin, if anything, have a 5% excess in acute kidney injury in the postoperative period. So it's not only beneficial, but potentially toxic when given at that particular time, no? not, not the normal starting, but just perioperative. So one has to be uh, very careful. The other thing uh, and the last thing that I'm uh, going to tell you is also related to the chicken and the egg problem in human age of fibrillation. In animals, of course, we don't have that. You know, we take an animal, it's healthy, patient induced IF causes all of these things. Uh, and uh, we are looking at uh, um, the result of this and we conclude, yes, all of this are consistent with uh, uh, favoring either functional re-entry with the effective refractory period or, uh, you know, proper re-entry because we have an obstacle through conduction velocity, et cetera. But actually, is this really what happens in humans? And how important is what happened after atrial fibrillation versus what it was there before atrial fibrillation started? So one way of looking at that is by using the genetics because genetics is there first. So here are the epidemiological data, so not the observational data. And if we take a, a um, measurement of conduction time here, and we have uh, uh, the PR interval of the ECG, and we look at it against the risk of age of fibrillation, we have a biphasic response here. But essentially, the longer the atrial AV conduction, uh, uh, the, the higher the risk of age of fibrillation. And then there is this slight U curve here. 
But again, you know, here they may be confounding because these are patients that were referred to hospital. Um, and so it may be that uh, they had ischemic heart disease and that is causing uh, independently an increased risk of IF and a prolongation of the PR interval, for instance, or reverse causality because patients uh, uh, who had atrial fibrillation or a history of atrial fibrillation were not uh, um, um, excluded. So it could be that this is the result rather than the cause of atrial fibrillation. But, you know, uh, to, uh, as I said, we can look at genetics. So we abandon this part of the circles and we can focus on UK Biobank, which is a prospective study uh, that um, uh, is undergoing in the UK. It's half a million men and women that were recruited now quite a long time ago now, when they were 40 to 69 years of age across the UK. And, uh, you know, we know a lot about them. Uh, we know the um, uh, history, family, medical, educational, the diet, the habits, uh, and a number of uh, um, other variables such as their cognitive function over time, uh, we know their physical activity, we have bloods, they're all genotype and they are being sequenced now and 100 and thousands of them have uh, magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, the heart and the body as indicated here and in this group we are doing uh, uh, long-term uh, ECG recording to look at uh, the uh, um, prognostic uh, meaning, if you like, of silent uh, arrhythmias. But that's another story. What we are looking at uh, uh, today is this. Can we say that the ECG PR interval is uh, uh, oops, uh, a uh, surrogate of the atrial electrical and structural substrate. And so we could ask the question, are genetically determined uh, differences in the ECG PR interval linked to atrial fibrillation? So we're sure that they come first and in which direction do they go? And we can also then look at a number of sensitivity analysis to make sure that this is not secondary to changes in atrial structure or a, a risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And we do what is called the Mendelian randomization. Essentially, in a conventional trial, you know, you randomize your patient to a drug, and we'll talk about statins, so uh, we, we'll stay on statin uh, versus a placebo. We look at the difference in LDL cholesterol and then at the events. Uh, in uh, Mendelian randomization, uh, the, we, we assume that in the population there is a random allocation of alleles. And so we have uh, two types of genotypes, uh, one associated with a slightly lower cholesterol, one with uh, unchanged or slightly higher. And then we look at its impact over a lifetime of these relatively small changes or sometimes larger changes on uh, events. And so this is what we did here. We looked at all the um, GWAS for these ECG parameters that were published, um, built a genetic score, and then we looked how these variants uh, that we know are uh, associated with uh, differences in the PR interval, and we also looked at the QT interval here, are actually uh, affecting the risk of atrial fibrillation. And in UK Biobank, we have uh, about 20,000 cases of atrial fibrillation, so we can do something quite robust. And here is the result. Uh, somewhat uh, in intriguingly, this is what we found. And that is that uh, the longer the PR interval, genetically determined PR interval, the, within the normal range of the PR interval, the lower is the probability of developing atrial fibrillation. So exactly the opposite of what the epidemiological data uh, would tell you. So one is the egg and the other one is the chicken somehow. 
and uh, therefore, uh, you know, and this is actually independent of age size and other risk factors and mostly associated with variants uh, that are around the uh, sodium channel, for instance, interestingly. So that we can see then, therefore, what I was saying, this is likely to be a consequence of uh, uh, atrial fibrillation or other diseases rather than a prime cause uh, um, for uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, independent cause of atrial fibrillation as shown here. So this is actually interesting because it might explain why flecainide works because flecainide, uh, you know, this is up to 2020 here, we, we have the sentences in this review that says, the precise mechanism responsible for flecainide's conversion and suppression of atrial fibrillation is unknown because flecainide is a sodium channel blocker and as such it prolongs conduction and as such it should be pro-arrhythmic uh, in the atrium but is not. And, uh, and has really no uh, effect on the atrial effective refractory period. And so you could see that using now this big data and technique and genetics, we can, we can start to unravel uh, the causes and the consequences and therefore to target potentially our treatment uh, uh, much better. So what I've said so far is that uh, studies of mechanism underlying uh, atrial fibrillation induced remodeling have shown novel pathways uh, that regulates repolarization and fibrosis that can be targeted by drugs or uh, other therapeutic options. But, you know, at the moment, uh, we're not quite there. Uh, we, we, we know that these uh, pathways are potentially problematic, uh, uh, both in terms of um, microRNA therapeutics, for instance, intrinsically, but also um, for uh, um, fibrosis, we are not there yet. Uh, but, you know, the more evidence we have, uh, the more we have the hope uh, that something new will come, particularly uh, if we look at atrial fibrillation as a disease of the heart and not just a problem, uh, local, you know, a problem that is associated with uh, uh, the pulmonary vein only. So it is also important, uh, as I said, to really look at to which extent these mechanisms are causally related to human atrial fibrillation uh, rather than being a consequence. And here, uh, a judicious use of techniques, the techniques such as Mendelian randomization uh, really would help answering this question probably much better than a mouse would. And so here, uh, I only wanted to, again, show all the fantastic people I work with, uh, a very international group. Some of them are collaborators, the ones with collaborators, the one with the star. Some are doctors, so these ones, and some are scientists. And uh, uh, without them, nothing will happen. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Cassidy, that was a 24th lecture, the best I've heard so far on the primary mechanism of atrial fibrillation. And I congratulate you for being the Henry N. Newfield Memorial Lecture of 2021. It's indeed depressing that after so many years attacking atrial fibrillation, you show a lifetime of work that there's still so much more to do. And we are still stuck with anticoagulation and invasive approaches to atrial fibrillation. We really need a switch for AF. And I think your work, if you can unravel it, may be the elixir for anti-aging, I think. And we really look forward to some answers. Uh, there, there's a lot of questions I have, but maybe you'll take one from the audience coming from Andy. And he, she, uh, he asks, uh, Professor Cassidy, in AF uh, diseases states, how, how much of a role does cytokine or genetic or inflammation have in a rising of AF? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the honor that you bestowed on me. Uh, it, it really is uh, very great and I, uh, I feel uh, very grateful for, for this opportunity and also this opportunity to show 
the work uh, of so many people that have been uh, really uh, engaged uh, in, in trying to do something different uh, about atrial fibrillation for so many years. And I think that is really the key. You know, we really need to look at atrial fibrillation with uh, fresh eyes. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we've had uh, great advantages with what we could do with uh, ablation and uh, antiarrhythmic drugs. I think we have reached um, the max there. I think that the, the diff a slightly different technique in ablation, I mean, probably some of my uh, electrophysiological colleagues uh, would not uh, like me to say that, but I doubt very much that a slightly different way of ablating is going to be anything but incremental, uh, you know, marginally incremental. So I think it is time to look at uh, the substrate of atrial fibrillation and to unravel it uh, and, uh, and have uh, and look at different solutions uh, and different, uh, different therapeutics and different therapeutic star targets in particular. So the genetics has helped us to identify some of them and to understand that is not only an electrical problem, but also a muscle problem. And so that different patients with atrial fibrillation may react differently uh, to treatment, something that we don't consider so much at the moment. Uh, we only look at drug toxicity, and that is what makes us use a drug versus another. Uh, you know, the, the inflammation uh, is uh, a concept that has been around for a long time. You know, from when sterile pericarditis in dogs was shown to cause atrial fibrillation. Um, there are a number of putative mechanisms. Uh, uh, but I, again, I do not think that this should be taken as an overarching mechanism. That is, there may be patients in which the inflammatory component is important and others in, in whom uh, is not. Uh, you know, we have looked, uh, we, as uh, I said, we're very much focused on post-operative atrial fibrillation. And, uh, you know, in that model, which is particularly inflammatory, because atrial fibrillation occurs in the first two days post-op when the cytokines are max. If you measure the cytokines, but also you measure uh, NT pro BMP, you know, the, the, the preoperative level of NT pro BMP as well as the post-operative is a much more powerful predictor of post-operative atrial fibrillation than circulating cytokines early in the uh, post-operative period. So, you know, uh, there may be something, but, uh, and there is a signal on the interleukin-6 receptors, genetic signal, but is weak. So there's something there, but not particularly strong. And I think, again, we shouldn't look for the magic bullet. You know, atrial fibrillation is a complex disease of old age and that may be several. Indeed. Uh, um, I, maybe it's one last question, perhaps uh, in the interest of time for myself. I saw that you have a very promising genome genetic, huge cohort, half a million patients, and you look at GWAS for atrial fibrillation. But I understand the differentiation when the patients become older for GWAS techniques are quite weak. So how do you use GWAS? Do you think there's promise in using a genetic uh, population-wide approach to this and where is this headed? Uh, yes, the, no, I, I do. I do, uh, you know, the problems uh, that you uh, outline only happen if you are looking at one thing exclusively. You know, if, you know, the, the, the genomic risk scores are another tool in, in our hands, you know, it's something that can particularly help uh, uh, us with discriminating the risk in categories that at the moment we would consider at lower risk, you know, and we would not do, for instance, in the case of ischemic heart disease, we would not start any prevention, say women or younger people, you know, and, uh, you know, within that, there would be a group that is at high risk as identified with genetic tools. And the same is true for stroke and the same is true for atrial fibrillation. So, you know, if you were to screen, 
you know, you may want to keep an eye on those. So it is helpful, even if it's not, you know, the solution to every problem that we have, of course. So we have to summarize, uh, Professor Cassidy, there's so many targets that we can go after. So much work has been done by you. So much dedication in, in, the, in looking at AF and fibrosis. Um, there's just so much that we want to ask you, but there's no more time to ask you any questions. <laughs> so we would want to maybe connect up with you via email or any other yeah, means sure. if there are more questions. So it just remains for me to thank you for your fascinating lecture this evening. I think there was so much shared, so much pearls of wisdom. I'm sure it's inspired many people around the world to perhaps look for new analysis uh, to prevent atrial fibrillation. So thank you so much, Professor Cassidy, and thank you for thank sharing you. your, your Thank you very much. Us. Thank to you. The audience and Good of course, evening. I'm happy to answer every question. Thank Thanks, you uh, so much. Thanks, bye Professor bye. Cassidy, uh, for the stellar lecture. And uh, everyone, please uh, keep on the follow up on the questions. And uh, I'll see you at the next session. Thank you very much. And goodbye. Thanks.